Welcome to a three-part documentary on the legendary Polish and later Hungarian hero and general Józef Zakarias Bem. In the first episode, we will talk about his early years, his early military career, and his merits during the Battle of Ostrolejka that made him an internationally known general. Bem was born in 1794 into a noble family in Tarno, a town in Galicia that was under Austrian control. As the Napoleonic Wars ravaged the area and the major powers divided the Polish lands, the Bem family moved to Krakow, where Józef entered the military academy. He stood out from his fellow students and especially shown in the field of mathematics. At just 15 years old, he joined the Polish army as a new recruit. In 1812, he joined the forces of Napoleon and took part in an infamous invasion of Russia as a sub-lieutenant. He distinguished himself in the defense of Danzig, earning the Knight's Cross of the Legion d'Honneur. After the Congress of Vienna in 1815, the Constitutional Kingdom of Poland was formed into the client state of the Russian Empire. Josef joined the Warsaw Military Academy as a teacher and he developed a prototype for a new missile weapon. Not losing his patriotic feelings, he entered a conspiracy against their Russian overlords, but his participation in the secret organization was discovered and he was demoted and sentenced to one year in prison. Bram resigned from the army and moved to Lvov in Galicia where he started to research steam engines, eventually publishing his results. However, even in his exile, Bem stood ready to aid his home country whenever he was needed. In the late 18th century, after long years of wars, Poland was partitioned three times by Russia, Prussia and Austria. After the Congress of Vienna in 1815, Russia annexed the eastern parts of the Polish lands and created the Kingdom of Poland with the Russian Emperor Alexander I as its king. The first years were prosperous. The economy was booming, new industrial buildings were constructed and the Polish army, independent from Russia, was created. Poland was at the time the most liberal country in Europe with its own constitution and parliament called the same. However, in 1819, censorship was established and in the years from 1820 to 1825, public gatherings were forbidden and the openness of the same sessions were removed. After the death of Alexander I, his brother Nicholas I replaced him, and two years later, in 1827, the new emperor ordered mass imprisonments of Polish independence activists. In 1830, successful revolutions in Belgium and France created the perfect opportunity to fight for independence. The spark in the powder keg was on November 9th, swift action of Polish officers aimed to capture Grand Duke Constantine. They failed to capture the Duke, but managed to capture the arsenal with a large supply of guns, sabers and ammunition. The next day, they took over the capital with the help of citizens and this turned this military coup into what is known today as the November Uprising. After a few months, Polish ambassadors went to Petersburg to parley with Nicholas. In response, the Tsar mobilized the Russian army. The next year, on the 27th of January, due to failure in peace talks with Russia, the Polish dictator and general Józef Szlopicki handed in his resignation. This allowed the Radical Patriotic Society to pass a bill that effectively dethroned Nicholas as the King of Poland. This turned the November Uprising into the Russo-Polish War. When Adam Jerzy Czartowski was signing the act, he said, This act infuriated the Emperor who in response sent a 115,000 strong Russian army under Hans Kar von Diebich to attack Poland. The Polish government failed to levy the peasants as they were reluctant to join due to not receiving land grants from the regime. On the 5th of February, the Russian army crossed the border and clashed with the Poles at Sietlce, Stocek and Wawer. However, in every battle, the Polish forces were victorious. On the 25th of February, the Russian high command decided to head straight to Warsaw but their army was stopped mere two kilometers away from the capital in the indecisive battle of Grochowska. In March, Józef Bem joined the Polish uprising and took part in their counter-offensive led by Jan Zygmunt Skrinecki. Bem was promoted to the rank of major and he was assigned the command of a light horse artillery unit. In April, in the battle of Iganie, the Polish forces defeated the Russians and Bem distinguished himself in the fighting. The offensive continued in May with an aim to find and destroy the Russian Guard infantry regiments that were located in the vicinity of Amza and Ostrolejka.
Stranetsky decided to attack Ostrolejka with around 48,000 men and 180 cannons, but Hanskar von Diebich was prepared to push back the Polish forces and marched against them with 53,000 soldiers and 245 cannons. In 1831, on the 26th of November, the two armies met near the village of Ostroleka. The Polish 5th and 4th Infantry Division was acting as a vanguard force and their task was to delay the Russian advance before the main army could reach the city. At 9 am, the Russian attack commenced and the Polish contingent was overpowered and was forced to retreat back to Ostroleka and eventually back across the Narev River. This sudden Russian attack shocked Stronetsky and he sent General Ludwig Boguslavsky with the 4th Regiment across the river to defend Ostroleka to the last man. At 11 am, the Russians attacked the village. From the south, the Russian Astrakhan Grenadier Regiment closed in, while from the north, the 1st Kurassier Guard Cavalry charged the Polish defenders and the Russian artillery fired upon them relentlessly. The buildings caught on fire while a fierce fighting ensued on the streets. Eventually, the Russians took Ostroleka, while most of the Polish forces retreated to the main army. The Russian artillery was deployed on the bank of the Narev to bombard the Polish forces on the other side, near the vicinity of the bridge. After the town was secured, Dibic gave the orders to cross the river. Skrinetsky counterattacked, but couldn't force the Russians back across the bridge. From 1 pm until about 6 pm, this back and forth continued as both armies were determined not to give an inch to the other. However, the Polish army was running low on manpower and supplies, and the Russian forces slowly kept crossing the river. Around 7 pm, the Polish high command was suspecting a final enemy charge, so they ordered Józef Ben and his 4th Regiment of Light Horse Artillery to go as close as possible to the enemy and open fire. Ben recklessly, but brilliantly, positioned himself in between two Russian regiments, very close to the bridge, and for almost two hours barraged the Russians who responded with artillery and musket fire. However, this bold maneuver surprised Divic, who suspected that the Polish army received reinforcements, so he withdrew his army back to the eastern bank of the river in order to avoid defeat. This allowed the Polish army to retreat back to Warsaw. And thus the battle was over, and both armies suffered great casualties. The Polish forces lost 6,224 soldiers while the Russians lost 5,696. Field Marshal Dibic was so impressed by the Poles and Bam's bold maneuvers that he stayed on the eastern bank for the whole next day. Neither side claimed victory, as they both thought that they had lost. The words of Napoleon Bonaparte describe this battle perfectly. Tout est opinion à la guerre. Opinion sur l'ennemi, opinion sur ses propres soldats. Après une bataille perdue, la différence du vaincu au vainqueur est peu de choses. C'est cependant incommensurable par l'opinion, puisque deux ou trois escadrons suffisent à le coup produit en grand. Today, this battle is seen as a Russian victory, because after Ostrolejka, the Polish army was consistently on the defensive. In September, Warsaw fell, and in October, the last remnants of the Polish forces have capitulated. Dibic, however, could not see the end of the war, as in June he died of cholera, and Ivan Paskiewicz finished the invasion of Poland. Ben moved to Paris in exile, but never gave up on his dreams about a free Polish country. And years later, he would find himself leading revolutionary forces yet again.